Good morning. Today, our lesson is about Saul of Tarsus. It is from Acts 9 and verses 1 through 31. This is one of the central task, uh, texts of the New Testament. And my suggestion before you watch the rest of this uh, lesson is that perhaps you should read Acts 9 verses 1 through 31. As I stated, this is a central text of the New Testament. Uh, Paul is described as the founder of the Christian church. And we all know Jesus Christ is the reality and authority of the church. Paul was the missioner. He was the one who organized the early church. He offered reasoned theology. He was a very intelligent man and worked with ideas and discussed with many uh, in his community. The challenge to the opposition uh, around him, the Gentiles and non-believers, was certainly an area where he uh, tried to make an impression and offer them the beliefs and the joys and the, I don't know a, a word, uh, the joy of being a Christian believer. The appearance of Jesus to Paul on the Damascus Road was central to Paul's life. And here, remember, we're calling him Paul. Uh, the difference from Saul to Paul is profound. And I think many of us today know that Paul is certainly referenced uh, in many Christian communities as the founder of the Christian church. Jesus changed Paul as he describes in Acts three different times. It was central to his life and his work. He was a totally changed human being. And I think that we need to consider how we are changed by the belief in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We need to know that our lives are centered in him and that he is there for us. Let us open with prayer. Dear God, help us to ask how important Jesus Christ is to our life today. We read in the scripture of many different situations, but the all important thing is how does Jesus Christ make a difference in our lives? Give us the answer and let your Holy Spirit live and work in us today. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to read the scripture for today, and the scripture in our book comes from the ninth chapter of Acts, verses 9 through 17. For three days Saul was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street, call straight. And at the house of Judas, you look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands upon him so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, 
I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, Barbara, it's back to you. Okay. The section I'm going to talk about is the change of call, is change of life. And I think we've read a whole lot in the New Testament about Paul and his readings and so forth. So I'm going to talk a little bit about who Paul saw was before his conversion. He was born in Tarsus in Sicilia around AD 1 to 5 in a providence in the southeastern corner of modern day Tarsus, Turkey. His parents were Pharisees. They were fervent Jewish nationalists who adhered strictly to the law of Moses, and they also sought to protect the children from contamination from the Gentiles. He could speak Greek and passable Latin. At age 13, he was sent to learn from a rabbi and saw master Jewish history, the Psalms, and the works of the prophets, the words of the prophets. His education continued for five or six years. He learned things such as dissecting scripture. He developed a question and answer style of teaching known in ancient times as diatribe, which helped rabbis debate the finer points of Jewish law to either defend or prosecute those who broke the law. I didn't know this, but according to God questions in the Bible, it said he became a lawyer and all signs pointed to his becoming a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish Supreme Court of 71, who ruled over Jewish life and religions. He was zealous for his faith, and that faith did not allow for compromise. Because of that zeal, Saul went down the path of religious extremism. Uh, Peter delivered his defense of the gospel and of Jesus in front of the Sanhedrin, and it, Saul would have heard that. The rabbi who Gamabel, who Saul learned Jewish from, was present and delivered a message to calm the council and prevented them from stoning Peter. Paul was also probably at the trial of Stephen and definitely was present for his stoning and death. According to Acts 7, 58, he held the garments of those who did the stoning. After the death of Stephen, Acts 1 slates, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. Saul became determined to eradicate Christians, ruthless in his pursuit as he believed he was acting in the name of God. Obviously, Ar in argument there is no one more frightening or more vicious than a religious terrorist especially when he or she believes they're doing the will of the lord by killing innocent people that's exactly who sarah Taurus was a religious terrorist acts 8 3 states he began ravaging the church entering house after house and dragging off men and women and he would put them in prison in other words, Saul was angered and filled with murderous rage against the Christians. Before departing on the journey in our passage today, Saul had asked the high priest for letters to synagogues in Damascus, asking for permission to bring back any Christian, or as he called them, followers of the way, back to Jerusalem to imprison them. His life changed dramatically when he was on that road to Damascus. And met Jesus who said, Saul, Saul, why are you prosecuting me? 
And when Saul asked who he was, Jesus answered clearly and directly, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. From that moment on, Saul's life was turned upside down. From that point, he worked as hard to save the people as he did to persecute them before his conversion. What can be learned from Paul? First, we learn that God can save anyone. Every person matters to God from the good, decent, average person to the wicked, evil, degenerate one. Everyone will not have such a dramatic conversion as Paul, and it doesn't have to be in a church. Two of my husband's uh, siblings had conversions later in life. His brother, who was fond of four-letter words, uh, went to a church <laughs> service one night and was converted and never used an inappropriate word or used the Lord's name in vain the remaining years of his life. His sister was an hidden alcoholic for years, and one day she was just sweeping and cleaning her house, and God spoke to her and healed that illness, and she never drank another drop, and she would tell her testimony to anybody that would listen until she passed away. We also learn from Paul's story that anyone can be a humble, powerful witness for Jesus Christ. Paul was very humble and not afraid to tell others what the Lord had done for him. Finally, we learn that anyone can surrender completely to God. Paul was fully committed to God. He praised him continually and shared the good news. He had surrendered his life fully, trusting God for everything. That was a very dramatic change in his life. Thank you, Barbara. Those are great comments. Betsy, it's back to you, please. We're going to talk about the area had eyes but could not see. Old and New Testament references to God and Jesus say they have the power to make the blind see. Paul's experience on the road to Damascus is the rare occurrence where a man is blinded so that he can be made to see. On the road to Damascus, they who were with Paul could hear the Lord, but they could not see him. Ananias, when he arrives at the house where Paul was staying, states that Jesus sent him to Paul to restore his sight and to allow him to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul realized the restoration of his sight made him know that Jesus was Lord through the presence of the Holy Spirit. His ministry told of his spiritual blindness changed by belief in the Messiah and through God's power in the risen Christ. Okay, thank you, Betsy. Well, my subject is spiritual blindness. The author talks about uh, when we as Christians ignore the tenets of our Christian faith, we are spiritually blind. Uh, and he gives some examples in the, from the Bible of where people were spiritually blind. The question that comes to me is, uh, what is spiritual blindness really today? I have a different take on it. Uh, is spiritual blindness alive in our society? And what is it? I do think spiritual blindness is alive and well today. And, and here's what I think it is. I think it's when people have heard the message of Christ and have rejected that, they are spiritually blind. Uh, Max Lucado says that by and large, people reject Christianity for two reasons. The first reason they reject it is because of pride. People believe they are self-sufficient, that they don't want to humble themselves before others and admit their wrongdoings and their failings in life, and their pride gets in the way of them accepting Christianity. The other reason, he says, that people do not accept Christ is because they feel like they are too bad, that nobody as bad as I am, could possibly be loved by anybody. I had an event, uh, oh, it's been five years ago now, I guess, 
uh, I was going into the library downtown and there was a guy sitting there on one of the benches where, where you could sit. He was sitting on one of the benches and uh, he said, hey, guy, do you have any spare change in your pocket? And uh, I said, maybe. And I reached in my pocket and I had a, I don't know, 50 cents maybe. And I handed it to him and I said, what are you going to do with this? And he said, well, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to buy some wine if I get enough money. He says, I'm an alcoholic. And he said, basically, my life is a life full of wrongdoing. And I said, well, have you ever been in the church? And he said, I grew up in the church, but I got so bad that the church wouldn't accept me. And I said, uh, you know, I think you've got it all wrong. The church is filled with bad people. That's why Christianity exists. You know, it's for people who are so bad in their behavior and so filled with sin that the only alternative is to ask God to forgive them. And he said, well, I know if I die tonight, I'm going to hell. And I said, it doesn't have to be that way. Do you ever go to uh, up here to the uh, place where they serve food? And he said, uh, yeah, I've been in there a few times. And I said, well, let me suggest to you the next time you go in there, I ask to talk to Pastor Will and just tell him you're a bad person and you don't know what to do about it. And I bet you he'll have an answer for you if you'll listen to him. So, you know, there was a great example of spiritual blindness, I think, and it exists all around us. So uh, today, let's think about that. So Betsy, I, no, I believe Barbara's going to close us with prayer. Hey. And just as a reminder that this will be our last session until September. We'll start back right. in September. Yep. So if hope, everybody has a good summer, let Same us pray. Here. Heavenly Father, thank you for our lesson today, which tells us you can choose anyone to serve you and can change anyone's life to be the person that you want him and her to be. We all have sinned and continue to do so. Thank you so much for your forgiveness over and over. Your grace is evidenced by the cross. Your mercy by not giving us what we deserve. Your love regardless of what we do. You are awesome and holy. Be with each and every one of us during the three-month break. We pray that each person remains well and will join us again in September. Be with the members and families and friends of our congregation who are grieving, ill, lonely, and may be facing other times of transition. Be with Waverly Road and its ministries and missions. Please let it be a light to the community. Let us accept your guidance and be strengthened by your love and accept the peace and commitment, contentment you want for us. It, have your way in our life and help us to accept that will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 See you later. Bye.